thank you for joining us today. If you don't know me, my name is Shelly Bailey. I'm the Visual Arts Supervisor for the Jefferson County Board of Education. Today for our Lunch and Learn, we are joining Nelson Grice, and he is going to talk to us about his work and as an artist and his career as an educator. And I'm going to pass this off to Nelson and let him get us started and start talking about his work. So Nelson, I'm going to pass it off to you and let you kind of Introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your background before we start, and then we can roll into some of your work. Okay, well, I probably will answer some of your questions and what I'm going to start up with and probably along the way Perfect. Um, before you even ask them, but um, I'm going to go, I'm going to go way back, right, um, to when I was in high school, because that's where this really kind of all started. Um, I had no direction. I didn't know what I was going to do um, going into my senior year of high school. I knew that I, I like to dabble with uh, art, doodling, creating, crafting, in carving. I like to build things when I was a kid. And maybe there were a few times when I had maybe even mentioned to my parents that I wanted to be an artist when I grew up. I do remember those times. I didn't think it was serious. I just... Um, felt like, I don't know, maybe that was just some kind of premonition. You know, I just felt inside that that's what I would be doing. A lot of other interests overlapped at the time. But uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm in high school. I'm starting my, well, it was my junior year and I was picking classes and someone said, hey, you take that f photo class with Soonbox Sellers. It's really easy and um, she's funny and um you'll get an easy A. And I thought, well, that sounds good to me because I wasn't getting easy A's in anything else. So I thought, well, I, I'll do that. I end up getting in this class and um, absolutely falling in love with photography. I spent just every moment I could taking pictures and going to the dark room and developing. And uh, she was very encouraging. She was... Uh, just a fabulous, fabulous person. I mean, she's still living. I'm speaking as if she's gone. She was a great encourager. And um, I actually ended up buying my own darkroom equipment. And I, I couldn't just wait to have my turn at the darkroom at school. I would go home and I would stay up. I would look at the clock and it's like two in the morning. I'm, I'm developing pictures. And uh, absolutely just loving what I'm what I'm doing and um, she really helped to, to point me into a direction and and I say it's probably hyperbole but I do believe she saved my life in in a way and so I went on to college thinking I was going to be a, a photographer and I was going to major in photography and once I got to college I realized I could draw and I could paint. Now, where did you go to college? Well, I, I, like I said, I wasn't that great of a student, so I had to actually go to Jeff State because I didn't have the ACT score nor the grade point average to get in anywhere else. So I went to Jeff State and I had a wonderful art teacher there who was, um, her parents were immigrants from Germany during um, Hitler's uh, reign there and they fled Germany and came to the U.S. Her name was Collinson. She was her married name. Her husband or her father was a, a famous um, expressionist painter. Uh, anyway, so she had then once again, she in, had this encouragement and she helped to lead me and show me parts of myself I didn't know. Again, let's, let's, let's just put that to the side with Miss Sellers. These are art teachers. These are art teachers that inspired me and changed my life. So then I was able to go on to Montevallo because I was I had the grades at that point and I my frontal lobe had developed and I stopped making bad decisions and started doing things right. And um, so I went to Montevallo and in 1990, I took my first clay class with Ted Metz and <laughs> it was like um, this major epiphany, just the, my insides just I just like, this is who I am. This is where I am. I said, I never want to take any other class except for clay now. Of course, that's not, you can't do that. So we had to write class like independent study three, you know, or whatever, so that I could keep doing clay until I graduated. 
Um, and when, when I got close to graduation in my, with my BFA at Montevallo, I, I thought, what do, what do I want to do? And I really thought a lot about it. And I, I, I said, you know, I want to be that person. I want to be that person that pulls kids from the, where they're falling through the cracks. They don't fit into the traditional educational scheme of that time and and but they're but they're artists and so i said i want to be a teacher this is what i want to do this is this is how i want to live my life i want to be that miss uh, sellers and miss collinson and i want to pull students into um this realization of who they are and what they can do and what they're capable of if they can't uh, memorize dates and 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 presidents and wars and and things in history, or they can't do uh, calculus at a, this point in their life or whatever. And I want to I want to give them something. So I went on and got my degree in uh, my master's of education and began to teach um, art. When I got out of school, I immediately got a job with Hoover High School. And um, it was so funny because Miss um, uh, Dr. Williams at the time, she was the principal. And, and of course, as I got to know her, I, I thought, I can't even believe I passed through an interview process with her. She was so thorough. But she said to me, well, I do have one spot available, but it's just um, a sculpture spot, teaching sculpture. Like, what kind of dream am I living here? I cannot imagine that she thinks that's a bad thing. I said, oh my gosh, you know, I'd love to do that. So I taught uh, for three years in the portables at, my, at uh, Hoover High School. That's when they had portables before Spain Park was built. And um, so I had pretty much just taught sculpture and ceramics for 25 years, although there were some stints where I wanted to teach some art history. I took, I, I formed an art history class. I did that, and then at the end of that year, I thought, what did I do to myself? That's a lot more work than teaching ceramics. <laughs> so with ceram with the kind of thing we do as art teachers, we get this opportunity really to, to um, I think, develop relationships with the students and with the kids that we may not have that opportunity if we were just lecturing all the time. So it was just a, it was just a, um, wonderful opportunity for me to uh, um, explore then continue to explore as an artist but also to develop these relationships and and i don't know help steer kids like those teachers um, steered me so um that's kind of you know 25 years later you know i decided to um, retire and to start doing uh, have a professional career, although I'd been building one on the side um, all along. But, um, and really the one thing I miss about teaching is that that is the students. Sure. I loved it. I loved being with those kids. Uh, at, what, at what point in your education career as, a, as an educator, as a teacher, did you make the decision that you wanted to personally create and work as an artist in conjunction with being an educator? Well, it, it feels very natural. It seems like it kind of, um, for me at least, I'm someone who uh, multitasks well. Mm -hmm. I'm also, I'm also uh, pretty efficient with, with the time that I have, although my wife seems, she thinks I, I layer myself too much. I have too many things going on at one time. But honestly, I'm just not happy unless there's um, several tables in my studio and there are three or four projects going on. So with my students, then I had the chance to create while they were creating. I would go to their where they were working and they would have something they were working. And I said, how do you make this? And I would sit down with them and I would make my own and they would make they would follow me and they would do what they're whatever they're thinking they want to do. And I would show them this is probably the best way to do this. I'll go to the next student. They would have something completely different all along over the years. Here I am. Just saturated with with this um, medium and building myself as an artist and, and really it wasn't until maybe even years later that I realized my gosh, this has been nothing but one long education that was um, that I was getting paid to do. <laughs> I was getting paid to learn. 
Yeah. And um, it was just a, a phenomenal. I, I would never, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. So back, I guess on the, when I'd been teaching for a few years, I just started um, uh, building sculptures on the side, not even the sculptures. I was a potter at that time. I was throwing pots on the wheel and I was selling work at little local um, galleries. I first started with Bare Hands Gallery, which was downtown Birmingham. And and then people started buying these things. And I was like, wow, that's a, that's a whole different feeling when you start to sell work. So it just launched, I guess, probably around the early 2000s, maybe one or two. And I started to build my own work. And I was teaching adult classes in my classroom. They were allowing that at Hoover. They would, they would take a portion of whatever we got of our fees from the students. And um, we were teaching adults. And one night, I had some sculptures sitting on the counter. And a couple of the students, the adult students, said, are you selling those? And I said, uh, yeah, I, I suppose, if you want to buy them. And there was big sculptures. Um, I was like, I guess maybe like $100 for that. And so <laughs> there were three of them on the counter and they all three sold within just a few minutes to three people in the class. And yeah, and that, so those were some of those taller upright pieces. And, and I just started building those and, and then taking them to galleries and selling them. And it wasn't really um, the money so much as just when someone buys something, you feel like you're, you're, you're somewhat validated and it gives you a little more license to keep working and maybe branch out and do different things. So I've actually, that's what I've got the screen open for. I've got some early work and, uh, and then kind of moves into what happened. If you want me to just go. Yeah, through that. love to. Love to um, see. Let's just take a look. So, um, let's see if I can get, there we go. So these are, these are just, um, that was that one of those uprights on the left those are some of the things that were just sitting that I was just experimenting with textures and finishes and um, building these big upright forms and at the time I was raku firing that's the one on the left uh, which which proved to be I mean I did it for years but they're just so brittle and people are always calling even today like I'll have someone call my maid broke this piece can you fix it <laughs> For so, those who don't know, can you explain uh, what a raku firing is? Sure. So, anything, I know that's a that's a big question or a big thing to to explain, but just to kind of help. Uh, it is. I'll just give you the condensed version. It is a. It was uh, originated as a uh, Japanese uh, form of uh, fast firing, and uh, we took it and kind of Americanized or Westernized this process and started adding specific types of um, colorants to to the glazes so that you could get these flashes of rainbow colors and uh, such. Um, but it's an outdoor firing and it's very fast. You put something in this raku kiln and within minutes you have a finished glazed piece which is a lot different than waiting 24 hours to unload your kiln. So you 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 pull it out of this kiln and you put it in a can with combustibles like leaves or sawdust and you close the can and all that carbon from that burning uh, those burning materials deposits onto the form and then that's what actually creates those colors those flashes of color so it's it's a it's a very fun process and I, I believe Janine um, she's got it uh, going on there at um, Mortimer Jordan. I remember uh, doing raku firing in college myself. It was fabulous. Yeah, yeah, right. And uh, any anything we did with Ted Metz was I fabulous. Mean, it was <laughs> good time. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, um, and then let's see here. There we go. So these are that's a that's a classic raku finish right there. And then I would actually start, and I, I felt a little guilty early on um, it, for adding acrylic paints to it. But then over time, I realized it's kind of like uh, Kandinsky said, uh, there's no must in art uh, because art is free. You know, like you just do, I mean, you don't, there are certain parameters that and border lines and boundaries we have to stay within in terms of process or material, but like to feel confined to, oh, well, that's just not the way the classics are made or that's not, that's not very traditional. Well, 
you know what, you know, what's traditional, you know, you're the one who's making traditional now. And for someone 10 years from now, who thinks, well, that's the way it's done. But, um, so the acrylic paint on this would be like the, the pig's head uh, in the face on the monkey. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I'll, I'll do that if I, if I need to, and then I'll make sure I clear coat these properly. So they age, right. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about something someone's going to put in the dishwasher and eat off of or whatever. Right. Um, so here's some little pieces. These are early, early, very crude pieces. In fact, I was at the Fairhope show this weekend and a collector of mine lives there now and we came, went to his house and he had some really old stuff I'd completely forgotten about. And um, I was still a little embarrassed to even look at them because they were very crude. <laughs> and, um, but I mean, they still love them. They had them, they had them prominent, prominently displayed. So, but in my opinion, like they could be better. <laughs> But that's just the way it is, I suppose. I think that all artists feel like their work can be improved. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so here's just, I'm going to go through some quick. And so my, I'm going to go way back again to when I was a, in high school and, and so on. When I was a, I tried to maintain that imagination. And that's another thing that about teaching is, is being in the world with those kids being in their world that's very fictional that's not real and they think this is like the real world they think this is what life is all about the way they respond in social situations the way they act from day to day and why they goof off and goof around and to live in that for 25 years with these kids that I, I i miss that because they would they would actually feed me i would feel energized oftentimes being around them and so i would bring these playful uh, emotions and these feelings and these all these great thoughts that the kids would pass on to me and I would I would feed that into my work so that I keep this playful look but um, that's what the pens and pegs and they look like little toys a lot of my works so then on the so then I this is just a couple of shots of me painting um, Someone asked me, well, can you, uh, I was a gallery. I was in, can you paint a couple of things for the show or whatever? And I said, yeah, I'll give that a shot. And I started painting. I only wish I had more time to paint, but I do not. Um, but uh, I did enjoy painting. I'll occasionally paint something if I find a, a time to do it or for a gift or something. Someone actually ordered painting for me while I was in Fairhope. So I've got to, I'll have to do that. I like to keep my feet in that a little bit. Um, Let's see what's next here. Uh, so if, if Jonah's, Jonah will watch this if he's not already watching it. So this was, so when I retired, right around when I was gonna retire um, and my boys had grown up and were pretty much out, I said, gosh, um, where am I gonna work when I retire? And I went downstairs, this is where I'm sitting now. Um, and I said, well, that's enough space to probably make into a clay studio. <laughs> so. <laughs> now my daughter was younger at the time and when she became a, a teenager she said I can't believe you took that rec room from me <laughs> but uh, okay. anyway, so here's the here's the same um, room and so what I did was add a sink I mean I made it into my space you know you have to make for up to that point I was just working in my garage doing some stuff I had a table set up so uh, if you feel like you don't have space there I've seen so many artists that have just little corners of a room they work in or they've you know built some little space on their patio and so there is a way to do it you just have to be creative you're creative you're artists and art teachers you're creative i know you can do something to create a space for you to work um so then i started making things i'd say are a little more were a little more complex this is still probably 10 years ago on this one but um, started to hone in on detail and craftsmanship and, um, but the, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to get off on that particular tangent without somehow tying it to the fact that I'm a teacher because as artists and as art teachers, I think it's important to, to continue to produce and create and, and the students will feed on that if they think, oh, well, um, this teacher over here teaches this thing, but they don't really actually do it. You're probably not going to get the kind of production out of them that uh, an, an artist, a practicing artist would get because they're going to take you more seriously. They're going to see what you do. 
I've had several students you know, go off and become artists, and that's what they do for a living today. In fact, there were two of them at the Fairhope show. One of them won a first place ribbon this weekend. So I was really proud of them. That's just what they want to do. And um, yeah, we have one the, the opportunity things to. Hmm? That I'm noticing your, if you'll go back one to your fish, that I see a lot in your work. And I just wonder if, you know, people who are viewing notice that you have so many textural elements in mm -hmm. your pieces, not just in the physicality of the textures, but even in the color choices and the finishes. Like yeah, this, thank you. this piece, you have matte finishes mm -hmm. where you've got the bones. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got more of a satin finish with the, the head and the tail, but then you've got this high gloss, this high metallic with this leg Casters thing. with the wheels. Yeah, the wheels that you've got. And that's what is so fascinating to me to your work is not only do you have these textural elements, but you have texture layered in color and finish. And um, I think that's what really kind of brings and draws a viewer into your work because there's there's a lot to see, you know, um, with with how you're combining all of these. And, and that's something that, you know, as people are looking at your work, I invite them to notice about your pieces is, mm -hmm. is the choices that you're making in how you're finishing out these pieces, not just in the construction of it. And the construction of your pieces are quite amazing too, because you have to really think about the balance of things. And mm -hmm. um, if you have to build an armature for something to support the weight of the clay, yeah. and when you set it down, is it gonna fall over? Right. <laughs> you know, I can't tell you how many times that I taught you know, a clay class or a sculpture class in my years too, where my kids are making things and then they kind of set it down and it's like, boop, <laughs> you know, it's all over because they've not right. thought about the weight, you know, of things. Yeah, yeah. So I think, anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, thank you. To be brought up because there's quite a feat of engineering and mm -hmm. then just the design elements of choices that artists make when they're aesthetically. So many creating their works of art you know sometimes people look at something and they go oh i can make that <laughs> and i'm like can you <laughs> yeah Let's yeah talk right. about that what is involved in the design of of a sculpture or a painting and right there's so many choices that an artist makes and all of the things that i'm sure you work out that don't work all the mistakes mm -hmm. and the problems. Oh yeah, yeah. That you're navigating through the the development of something. Yeah, it's true, and um, it's it's not even. I mean, that's not that's only the half of it. When you're building it, then you have to worry about at 2100 degrees in the kiln, right. which part of this is going to start to sink and sag. So you have to create some some uh, props and things in the kiln even to keep it from happening. But about your point about the mix of, of um, colors and finishes and textures, it, there, is a, there is a fine balance. And again, going back to um, uh, who we commonly, if we, everyone who knows him considers him like a demigod, and that's Ted Metz. Mm -hmm. I just remember in college, um, he said something that meant a lot to me and I've carried it with me for years. You, there's a, there's a really fine line about that. Um, there are, there is the potential for doing too much. And then you have what he referred to as too many pockets of information. It's too much stuff to look at that you can't really, you can't settle on it. And so you move on to the next thing. So what I always taught my students and I teach them even today um, the adult students that I'm teaching that I'll teach, I say um, I I gauge some of the success of a piece by how long they look at the piece. So to your point about well, you have to, you look at it, then you notice something, and then you notice something else, and it it requires you then to get closer and actually look at all of what's going on. To a point, again, not that you overload them to where it gets frustrating visually, but 
but you have in this interest that, that holds their attention. So if I can hold someone's attention on a piece, the longer I can hold it on a piece, the more successful that piece is, in my opinion. So that's a great point. That's what I that's kind of that's kind of my my MO. You know, I like to so someone could look at this one from a distance as they walk up and they say, Oh, it's it looks like a, a you know, a wolf sitting, and then they're like, but what is that a ladder? What are those, you know, screws and how's that made? So, so mm -hmm. it, it requires them a little more time to look at it. And instead of just quickly passing and, and just turning their head and walking away, oh, it's a wolf. So um, that's kind of been my, uh, the thing that I've, I love all those little details. I don't want to overdo them. So, but the whole glazing and the, the finishes, I, those come later, I'll build it. And then um, after it's fired, then I've got a whole nother problem to solve. And that is where do these colors go? What does this thing do? So um, there's the characters um, kind of grow out of, so when I'm building a piece, I'll start to kind of piece things together, just like a kid does with, with um, blocks in a, you know, then, you know, pull them out and you start building and it's like, what is this going to turn into? And um, so these are, again, are just some, some older works. Sometimes I'll come back to some of these particular uh, tactics for getting people's attention. Mm -hmm. um, this piece right here was commissioned by um, a woman that uh, has a, a business uh, remodeling homes for the stars and she does decorating and remodeling and um for a lot of very famous people she's um has a partner out in la and they work together and she commissioned me to do this piece it's got several she actually said i want this on it this on it, this on it these so i have all of the um the the leo i've got the lion i've got uh, pisces on the side so it's like her family and all of their um uh what their signs, their birth signs built into it. So then she had me do one for her friend in Los Angeles. And lo and behold, one issue of um, Architectural Digest comes out and I I knew that it was these, this couple, this Giovanni Ribisi and Emily Ward. And Emily Ward is the, the lady Holt sitting down that's, um, she's actually the partner in this business. So this piece showed up right there in architectural digest and of course you know i had to buy like 50 copies of that and I, they're all stacked up in the corner <laughs> right there <laughs> that's not true but i did buy a couple of copies you have to give one to your mom you know absolutely for sure <laughs> so you know once this happened i thought wow i'm you know i'm i'm there it's but you can <laughs> barely even see it and nobody sees it nobody saw it but me <laughs> right. so that's why i circled it <laughs> <laughs> i think that's wonderful <laughs> So then we, um, a really cool thing did happen, but I want to say this about, because I want to stay focused on just um, my fellow art teachers, uh, art teacher friends. You ha if you, if you're, if you want to be successful in the business, no one's going to bring this to you. They're not just going to say, hey, look, I've just done all this work for you. I mean, Theo Van Gogh, of course, made Vincent Van Gogh famous, but that was after Vincent was dead. And Theo just said, this stuff's too good to be sitting here in a closet or whatever. I'm going to promote my brother. And of course, we know him today because of Theo, not because of Vincent. You have to, if you want to be successful, and that might not even be your desire. I don't think it was Vincent Van Gogh's desire. I think he just painted as squirrels gather nuts. It's just something that we all are just compelled to do. If we're really artists, we can't live without it. I don't think he really even cared whether, it, I don't know if he cared whether he was famous or not, but um, I want to continue to make and be successful and have the um, uh, the means to do that. So if, you, if you're like that, you have to get up and go hit the pavement. You've got to you got to find out what that next thing is. Maybe that little gallery, that little show, um, and you got to keep the ball rolling yourself because other people are busy with their own lives. No one's going to do that for you. So that brings me to this picture. So I was teaching classes. Um, a friend of mine named Susan Gordon, and she is also a very successful um, artist and businesswoman, and I look up to her for all that she's done. 
but she before she did all that she taught she uh, worked at the uh, Shelby Arts Council in in Columbiana and she called me and she said hey we need someone to teach some um, classes and you had mentioned you you like to do something like that and I said yeah of course I would and so I got down and got plugged into Shelby County Arts Council and I stayed relevant in their minds by teaching more classes this opportunity comes available there they have these plans sitting out for this new building they were going to build i'm about two or three years away from retiring and i mentioned to bruce andrews who is the um, director i said you know all you're missing on those plans and i was just tongue in cheek i said all you're missing on those plans is a foundry in the back so we laughed he called me the next day he said i actually mentioned that to the architect and he said we've got room back there if we want to do that and I was just like, well, all right, I'm glad I mentioned it. And uh, so <laughs> right. at this new arts council, then they, they had this space. The architect came and talked to me and we built this foundry. We could not get it approved by this, the uh, Shelby County, um, uh, whoever it was that doles out the you know, permissions for that kind of thing. We had to go over his head and hire someone in Chicago to come and look at our equipment and give us uh, the green light. So. That's the only way we can get that done. But this is us at the foundry. Now, once I started doing bronze, and so here's another little step about getting out there, getting yourself promoted. I had found a gallery in Nashville, and I just went to this place and just unloaded my boxes. It's not the way you're supposed to do this. <laughs> Nobody wants that. They want you to just email them or whatever. But I, I just brought my boxes and started unloading them on the floor of the gallery, and, and the guy working says, hey, this is not what what you're supposed to do. And then he saw my work and he said, wait a minute, let me get the owner out here to see this. And so um, I got in that gallery, then another one in Nashville based on from the work there. And then the gal gallery in Charleston saw my work. This woman really knows about art. And so she said to me when I took my work there, she said, you need to start doing bronze. This work will translate well in bronze. And so I didn't really thought about bronze much uh, because I didn't have the wherewithal. I had no equipment. I, I didn't, I couldn't do that. So this, I started doing bronze with sloths and learning all about that. This was just a, just a beautiful opportunity. We built this foundry and I just started doing bronze work. Um, so this was a, a bronze piece, um, carousel horse, uh, these, these pieces are pretty large, actually. Um, they're very time consuming to do. And, um, you know, once you do, if you ever do a, if you want to do a bronze workshop, um, I will, I will lead one for you and we'll just build a, a class on that. But because people don't understand how much work is involved. And so a lot of people think, why is that so expensive? It's expensive because it's very difficult. It's not just that the metal's expensive, but, you know, maintaining the equipment's expensive. But the whole process, not to mention the scars on your body, you know, from burns and uh, things, you know, all the clothes you ruin and such. But when you say these are large pieces, uh, yeah, this one right here is about 28 inches tall. Okay. Um, it's it's a big piece. And this is kind of my one of this is kind of a signature piece of mine um, that gesture just became kind of my logo because I'm such a clown. I was a class clown in school. I always liked to entertain the class. The um, teachers never really liked that much. But uh, now I have a stage where I can do, I can entertain now and I can, I, can, I can be whimsical and I can be goofy and I can do it through my work. And um, that's just a little bit about some of that. Here's the back, uh, let's see, I got a back shot of that one. So you see, still maintaining those textures. The thing I like about the bronze is the bronze on its own just delivers. I mean, it just the finish on bronze just delivers without without any other fussing, you know. I did have color on the, the hat and, and things, but some of my bronzes, as you'll see with the monumental pieces, I don't put color on them. Um, so these uh, just, I like to, again, I like to make people question, like, what is going on here? I have no idea what's happening. So what is going on here? I would love <laughs> you to tell, you know, the viewers, I mean, what are you thinking about when you're creating that? Well, this, uh, this piece is called Baby Steps. 
So, uh, and I probably came up with that title after the fact, but um, I, again, going back to what I would teach my students, I said, um, the imagine, our imagination, the human imagination is, is endless. It's, a, it's just a deep, deep, deep pool of possibilities. The problem with, especially with, with kids after, I don't know, eight or nine years old, when they become self-aware, we all know all that, they be become so um, uh, conscientious of doing the right thing. And, and um, I tried to teach my high school students, I said, let's forget all that. And let's say, I'm just going to let my imagination roam. And so what I'll do is I'll just, I'll have my sketchbook and I'll, I should have put some sketches on here because most of the things I've made, I have some kind of sketch that led to that sculpture somehow. But um, I just probably started, I made this nest and the eggs and uh, feet have, these big feet have become part of my work and, and they were mostly early on because I didn't want to build a base for the work. I wanted it to be able to stand on its own without that. So I would make these huge um, bird feet or whatever. But um, then I started putting like human feet on those monkeys and I noticed uh, how people would respond to that always with a, with a smile, uh, some kind of just grin. Some people are freaked out by it, uh, which is also a compliment. Um, someone travel. someone came into my booth this weekend and I was in the back, they didn't see me. And they said, this is like stuff people's nightmares are made of <laughs> all of my work sitting out. It's hilarious. And, uh, but this particular, so this particular one, I, I thought, wow, this would look great up on legs walking around. I, I just like, why not? And, um, so that's kind of the genesis of most of my pieces, especially these bizarre, these bizarre pieces, you know, like this one. So. I think I went on to do, and and if you look at this one close, this is nothing but a pinch pot. If you strip everything off of it and flip that main body up right side up, it's just a pinch pot. I was probably doing pinch pots with my students, and I made this pinch pot and flipped it over and thought that'd be a great body for something. So I made um, a rubber mold of that pinch pot, and um, now I can just use it for the body of all just whatever or I could stack them all together I could make one big body with 20 of these and um, it's just it's just endless and your imagination is our imaginations are like I said just this this bottomless uh, and, and treasure again, trove you've got the physics happening here <laughs> you've got that's, a bigger bigger tour like but yeah, for, right. you know, for lack of better term yeah. for the the shell and then the feet, you've got this counterbalance of weight, you know, of thinking about, well, when it's in bronze, it's going to be heavy and uh -huh. what's going to prevent it from flipping backwards. I mean, the, the physical aspect of sculpture is something that always fascinates me and it's what yeah. I love. I love seeing these pieces like, how is that standing <laughs> upright? <laughs> right. So let me just now I'll just switch gears um, and just this is me. So when they opened the Arts Council, they found these. Uh, well, when they were digging actually for the foundation to put the building down, they found these um, big millstones because where the Arts Council is now, there used to be a corn mill there um, years ago, and <clears throat> they found these big stones lying together, covered up by all the dirt. And they were going to throw them out. And the mayor at the time said, whoa, those are relics. Let's do something with them. And they called me and they said, you think you can do um, a, a piece using this stone? And so I kind of came up with some ideas. And then we settled on, actually, since Columbiana is the county seat of Shelby County, I thought what no, no better thing to do with this stone than to turn it over and make it into a seat. Mm -hmm. So I've got a lot of things going on that this now that I'm looking and showing this you don't really see much of the detail on this piece but um it's now it's it gets sat on all the time every day someone comes and sits on it takes a picture um we we joked that we should put a little little donation box on there and just maybe collect coins or something 
And it's quite large because when I, I yeah. sat on myself and I look like a really small child <laughs> sitting in that chair. Yeah, the old Lily Tomlin, right? Yeah. I forget what the character was. She yeah. sat in that big chair. Yeah, I remember that. It's an oh. old 80s movie there. Mm -hmm. That's an old 1980s movie. Right. That's right. <laughs> so then um, I was, uh, again, let, let me just say this. I mean, they didn't just come to me for this Avondale sculpture, probably three years before this started, <clears throat> I actually approached um, a lady by the name of Martha Myers Council, who uh, her husband owned a building right here in uh, Avondale. And they had this little bitty um, elephant that they had out in the middle of that space by the, by the water. <clears throat> and it got hit by a drunk driver, believe it or not, that's a long way from the road. So Thank goodness nobody else was hit. And and I said, well, if you ever need, they already had an artist in mind that they wanted to do it um, because her husband was friends with him and her husband had passed. She wanted to honor what he wanted. So I said, well, just keep my, keep my name in your back pocket because I would really like to do this. And at that time, I had not done any large scale bronze. So uh, honestly, it would have been completely overwhelming to have tried to do it at that point. But she approached me then after the chair, maybe that was like a rite of passage. Oh, he can do this. So um, this is the site of where Miss Fancy is put down now. And um, I tackled that project. And let me tell you, it was it was not easy. <laughs> there were moments I thought, I'm just going to give back this money and stop because it was so hard. Um, it was just such a such a feat to, to do. This piece is 3000 pounds of metal. And it's, it's not just the sculpture of, a, of the elephant. I mean, it's, I spent a lot of time researching and reading stories and uh, talking to some older people that, believe it or not, are over 100 that lived back in these houses and remember seeing her. And so, so in this can piece, you explain a little bit about who Miss Fancy is for those who don't know anything about this? I, I sure will. Um, so she was, um, Avondale was the site of the original Birmingham Zoo back in the early 1900s. And when the depression, the depression hit, uh, they had to sell all the animals. This was the, the most prized of the animals. And that was, uh, Miss Fancy. And she would get out of her enclosure at night and she would wander sometimes and wander the streets of Avondale and end up in people's yards eating from their tree or whatever. And so um, she's got this, this legend, this folklore, and uh, it, which, like I said, I really actually spoke with people who saw it firsthand and it, it really did happen. So when I was studying her and just getting this image, they, they didn't really want something that was like uh, pins and pegs and toys like I do. They wanted it to be semi-realistic but they still wanted it to be childlike. They wanted it to be something that would be um, number one, matronly, but number two, playful. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I didn't want to make her look like your just basic elephant. I did keep true to two things, especially though, is she was an Indian elephant and they have smaller ears mm -hmm. and they do not have tusks. None of the female Indian elephants have tusks. So, um, I made her with those sort of things. And it's like I taught my students for years. I said, when we make, when we make, we're in a new day, like you can do things like in the Renaissance or like in uh, super realistic and you can do those things. And those things still have interest about them. But when you, if you want to just play, when you do an animal, you make sure, like if I say the word giraffe to you, what do you think of? Long neck, long legs. When I say the word elephant to you, what do you think of? trunk body big body big feet so i stayed true to those things without getting it too much like a toy with the bolts and the nuts and crazy one of the first one of the first uh maquettes i showed them they were like we don't really want something futuristic <laughs> that's what they called it <laughs> but um so then i did the the kids on the top and i took some artistic license at that particular zoo where miss fancy was only um, whites were allowed at that zoo. They didn't allow anybody of any color, other color or nationality to even come into that zoo or even into Avondale Park. 
So I actually made the little girl on the front is um, a little African American girl, and she's a kind of loosely based on one of the girls from the 16th street bombing, although that happened years later, mm -hmm. but I wanted to kind of honor her and I wanted to honor any minority that will ever come to this place and visit this sculpture that they are represented and she's on the front and I wanted her to have that place. Mm, that's beautiful. But I also, <laughs> I also said, you know, it'd be great for this second little girl to be my daughter. So the little, second little girl is a, a portrait of my daughter. And uh, in fact, I don't know if you can see it, but back there up on the shelf, her little clay head is leaning against uh, my wife's portrait bust, the one I used for the uh, sculpture here. But so it's got a lot going on and it was, um, it was very difficult. So when I, when I got the next project, um, which was Long Tall Silly, it went so fast. I couldn't even believe it. When I actually finished, I was just like, my mind was blown that I was able to complete it in so such a short time. Yeah. But uh, so that's what this one is. This is the beginnings of um, the one that's in Aldridge Gardens now. And um, again, I, I turn these wheels. I mean, people at this point aren't just you know, hey, come do this. I do have that now. I do have people that are that have called me and said, let's talk about doing this sculpture, that sculpture. But I had to I had to get those wheels turning myself. Nobody was going to do that for me. Um, so that's that's a good thing to pass along. Uh, so this is this is the finished piece. That's my beautiful wife next to me. And um, it's a fabulous uh, piece. Silly. And she is at Aldridge Gardens and she can be visited anytime. Uh, well, between the hours of eight and five, <laughs> <laughs> but um, that was a super fun. Like I said, when I finished the bronze portion of this, or when I finished it, and I walked away from, away from the foundry that day, I was just like, "Am I really finished? Is this possible?" Because uh, it went so much faster. It's like uh, Miss Fancy was some kind of boot camp for me, really. Um, so then the, the last slide is the next project now that I'm doing is working on this. I'm going to do a flamingo for the Birmingham Zoo. And um, I, this could be just, in my opinion, just the apex for me, because I think for years I um, wished that I could put a, a sculpture in the zoo. I, I've always, um, you know, admired um, the sculptures that are there. Of course, the Frank Fleming's. Um, and I think, how, how did he get so many pieces all over Birmingham? I mean, who was paying for all this? And I still wonder that. I mean, he has so many pieces all over the city. Um, but, you know, maybe that'll take. And I'm hoping, you know, once I get one in the zoo, maybe that, that'll, that'll broaden the, um, my visibility. Uh, and, and, and so this is just a sketch. And uh, it will change as I build it. There are things that, you know, you have to really think about with bronze and that's, uh, it is a very soft metal. And if you grab it in a certain spot and pull on it hard enough, you're going to bend those legs. So that's another, that's another <clears throat> engineering, uh, even going back to um, this one. I mean, that's just an engineer. If you could see it from the side, it's got this posture that's very much like a bird, but all that weight is, is pushed out front. So, um, but yeah, I think <clears throat> one thing I don't want any art teacher or artist or when you're teaching your kids, never, never say that you do this instead of doing math. <laughs> I heard so many times over the course of my career, people will say with good intentions, just joking. They'll say, well, you did that because you couldn't do math, you know, whatever mm -hmm. you, you avoided doing math. So you took a BFA. But uh, there is so much math. There's so much. There's so uh, there's so much engineering involved with with sculpture, especially. Um, I mean, it's not it's not for the faint heart. I always joked with my students. I said, "Well, I chose art because when we go to those career fairs in high school to choose a career, I said it was always the first one on the list, and it's the shortest one in the whole list. So I figured I could probably do it." <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, I mean, it's just, uh, I'm definitely living the dream now, but I am 55 years old, so I, I don't have, you know, a ton of years left to live the dream, but it did take this many years, but I don't even look back on my time of teaching and think that it was somehow 
just um, a, a way to travel to get where I am now. Every moment I spent in the classroom, I love it and I adore it. In fact, even this morning, I texted one of my, she's probably in her early 30s now. I saw on Facebook, she's getting married and she was a student of mine. And I texted her and I said, I really want to be at your wedding. So let me know when it, when it is because it, you're very important to me. And she texted me back. She said, you saved my life in high school. And I can't even believe you're texting me right now about this. Um, I said, well, you're important. My, all my stu students, especially those that were just like me in high school, they're, they're, they're just very dear to my heart. And right now in the classroom, each one of these teachers, each one of you are, are just living that life where you're, you mean so much to these kids and they don't, they're not going to tell you that right now. She wouldn't have told me that in class, but she's an adult now. So mm -hmm. those kids, you, you're, <clears throat> it's just, we make this eternal impact because we're not, we're affecting them, but we're affecting then their children and so on and so on. And you've heard all this before, but it's true. I get misty eyed thinking about it. Um, uh, I just really loved my time in the classroom. <clears throat> if you can try to practice your art, though, and your craft and let the students know you do that as well, it's going to really step up that respect. And um, they're going to they're just going to love you that much more for it. So I agree 100 percent, 100 percent. I always did that myself. You know, when I was teaching, even at, even with the littles, even at the elementary level, yeah. it's important, even at that age for them to see you creating other than what you're teaching them, you know, doing something different and unusual. You know, it's always surprising when I was a teacher and I would create and my students would say, you can draw. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, I can. <laughs> you know, they were always like surprised, you know, mm -hmm. that they just didn't associate, you know, the skill and the talent with what I was teaching until they saw me creating my own. And it always generated very rich conversations, you know, with my students. And like you, I wound up solving problems through my work and their work at the same time. And same thing that with you were talking about your students could inspire you. They would do the same for me as well. Yeah. And yeah. Um, my teachers hear me say all the time, I, I want you to be a working, growing artist, you know, that that they became an art teacher because they were an artist first, mm -hmm. that they had a love for art and that it's it's something that they need to constantly be um feeding, you know, because, yeah, you know, yeah. like you, you know, I, I don't know how I would be without art. It's so inundated in my life that I can't imagine not creating. And I create on a regular basis to the point that my kids tease me, you know, my <laughs> personal children tease me about, um, you know, whenever I go out and do things, you know, they're always like, did you eat glitter? Did you eat the paint? <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. no, <laughs> you know, they're all threatening whenever one of them finally does have a child of their own, that they're all going to name me grandma glitter. And I'm like, mm, I don't know about <laughs> that. <laughs> so, um, but I understand that, you know, in, in having that connection, you know, same with you, I still, connect and talk, you know, with students, former students, you know, of mine and um, still, you know, see them and go to their weddings and when they have children and mm -hmm. um, I'll still get an email or a note or a, a DM on a social media, you know, of impact, you know, and seeing how they've grown and, you know, it, it's good. not always the thought of the arts is not always we're expecting them to to graduate from high school and become an artist. You know, it's it's right. sometimes it's just to uh, help them to be more creative in their thought process and to view things differently and and to persevere and be able to work through problems because no nobody is a better problem solver than an artist. That's you know? true. That and is that's a really good point. 
and it and it doesn't matter if they're visual art or if they're an instrumental musician mm -hmm. you know they're writing and you know even in in the role that i have now i i've i never thought of myself as a musician you know or a singer but you know i've stretched myself you know um artistically and 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 can confidently say i can sit down and and write lyrics to a rap <laughs> a children's song. Greg Gamina is on here with us. He's seen it happen. <laughs> He's my proof. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, you know, I think that um, just stretching ourselves and exploring mm -hmm. um, is so valuable. And well, Nelson, I appreciate you more than you know. I appreciate your time and mm -hmm. for sharing your your skills and your talents with us and and walking through your journey as an artist and an educator, um, you, you are one of those people that I love to follow. I love to watch. I love to see what you're up to. I admire you so much. No, no idea. Oh How, and, I, and, and, and <laughs> the sounds do happen when you walk in the room. I, <laughs> I believe it because you are so gifted and you really you are so great at what you do and oh my goodness so inspiring so i just cannot i cannot praise you enough for what you do and i appreciate how much you give to your community and to children and um, so sweet it's a super special person that devotes their life and their career um, to the arts and to the arts for children and their growth so I have huge, uh, I'm a huge fan. That is so sweet. Well, I'm going to need to get all of this printed out so I can have it to read again. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, we will say goodbye for Thank now. You. Um, go ahead and close this. Thank you so much for your time. Thank yes. you so much um, okay. for joining us. We're dismissing the invitation. Bye. Bye, Shelly. Thanks for putting this together.